डॉक्टर संगमेश डॉक्टर अली कैफ डॉक्टर शाजील डॉक्टर रुद्रजीत सिन्हा इज विथ मी डॉक्टर रुद्रो यादव डॉक्टर सोमित सुभाष डॉक्टर अमृता डॉक्टर हाजी डॉक्टर जीना डॉक्टर सैतमा डॉक्टर शरण डॉक्टर तेज डॉक्टर अनूप कुमार सिंह डॉक्टर जाहिदा ओके आई डोंट नो समबॉडी एज कनेक्टेड विद आईफोन आई मीन गेट योर ओन ब्रांड है व्हाई आर यू एंडोर्सिंग समबॉडी एज ब्रांड है फाइन सो वाइल यू पीपल विल बी जॉइनिंग गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी टुडेस डिस्कशन विल बी मेनली ऑन रेनल लम्ब्स I think we had a lot of discussion on the, this uh, palpation and examination of renal lumps taking a case history. Okay, uh, so if anybody wants to talk, you can always interrupt me and talk. And I've also started this chat window on my side, so you can always uh, send your queries via the chat window. You have both options open. Now huh? you can also uh, talk. You can unmute yourself and talk. Ask me a question, or you can send your shoot your questions on the chat box. So. See today's uh, what we will be uh, um, uh, discussing today will be renal lump di differential diagnosis. So I want to break it down into three pack three uh, subsections. So one will be uh, benign renal tumors. Okay, uh, the two will be RCCs and the three will be uh, hydronephrosis. Okay, so whenever you have a renal mass lesion, now what is basically renal mass lesions are incidentally diagnosed. Okay, most of them are incidentally diagnosed. the previous triad of this hematuria renal lump huh, and uh, loin pain is happening in less than 10% you know textbooks it has been 10% but recent campbell says it's been less than 10% okay so about 50 to 60% or even 65% are now incidentally diagnosed renal masses this holds true also for uh, benign renal masses okay and uh, and 30 still 30% will be diagnosed at a metastatic stage advanced metastatic stage so as i said that uh, very rarely you will get a so obviously when you whenever somebody has a renal lump in the during the exams they will keep it as a long case okay so a renal lump uh, we will be talking about the different uh, how will you uh, palpate what is the history taking because uh, then basically you have to make it in your mind that it can be either a benign lump or a malignant lump. and a benign lump means hardly any benign renal tumors it means that you are dealing with a hydronephrosis okay and the mass will be most likely if it is palpable will be a 10 cystic mass hydronephrosis hydronephrosis again can be a primary to puj obstruction primary puj obstruction or it can be secondary uh, puj obstruction due to stones something else so secondary puj obstruction due to stones don't present with per se lump in the examination they can come with radiology uh, radiology uh, tables and everything else so either you have a uh, this puj obstruction or you will have a rcc so these are the basic two cases you will have in your exams uh, in your viva exams okay while when you are giving your theory exams there will be lot of many and uh, in your mcqs emqs and all these neat exams pgs you will be having facing a barrage of questions on this renal lumps and all these things okay so very important topic so i will be trying to compress it it's it will be a compressed fashion not everything will be discussed say, say i cannot be able or won't be able to discuss about that uh, radical nephrectomy with ivc thrombus case that's that's that will take a separate uh, discussion uh, session all together but we will be trying to compress everything together okay hello everybody who are joining late don't worry because we have just started we haven't started yet actually so let me share the screen mm. right i hope uh, everybody is able to see the screen and uh, that's why so we are starting with benign renal tumors okay now now okay fine now as you can see a benign the most common benign mass lesions will be the renal cysts okay now you can see in your practice those of you who are practicing and uh, in, in fact doing opds you will see a lot of elderly people coming to your uh, uh, opds okay wait a minute it is yeah ha huh. a lot of uh, elderly people um, coming to your opds with an incidental diagnosis of a renal cyst he he, he may be suffering from uh, some prostate issues but he gets more terrified when he finds a renal cyst on ultrasound 
So it's your duty to allay him. So this is uh, in 70% of the cases, uh, these are asymptomatic, as I said, and most of the cases are benign. Okay. I will be coming to the different categories, categorization of renal cysts. So the risk factors again are age. As I said, it's increasing age, you will find more evidence of renal cyst in the population. Okay, and they're more common in males. There is, there is uh, 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 somehow uh, there's a correlation with hypertension and there can be presence of renal impairment. Actually, the presence of renal impairment and uh, patients on CKD, patients CKD, patients on dialysis long-term, they're present with what is known as the acquired renal cystic disease. Now, these cysts do mandate a lot of follow-up and a lot of uh, treatment and a lot of uh, in management protocols because they are likely to turn malignant in the long term. Okay, so when we will come into discussion on the different types of RCC, because it's a bit and pieces all together, no? then they will, we may have an MCQ uh, of uh, a person, some uh, a short question like a person on hemodialysis, ESRD, hemodialysis, and he develops an acute renal cystic disease. And this person develops an RCC. Now, what is the type of RCC? They're mostly papillary form of RCC. Okay. The clear cell carcinoma do exist, but the papillary forms are more predominant with this ARCD disease. Sporadic, as I said, that's what I said. Sporadic disease, you will find them in plenty. And ARCD is the one, the acute renal cystic disease, patients with uh, this uh, hemodialysis on these nephrology patients follow up when they come. They can have the cystic disease and you cannot just tell them, okay, fine, you are having a cyst, don't worry, they can happen. And, and that, that, that's not the proper way you counsel a patient of a renal cyst in a ESRD patient or a patient on dialysis. Now, there will be cysts also associated with uh, tuberous sclerosis, a lot of him, a lot of familial syndromes, but these are more, mostly for uh, your uh, this theoretical and MCQs, not really for your uh, theory uh, question per se and vivas. Okay. On ultrasound, that is a typical renal cyst looks like is they have a smooth wall, they're mostly fluid filled, okay, and with no internal echoes. This is the basically the class one cyst or the totally non malignant cyst, okay. And they have evidence of posterior wall enhancement. Now, herein, I would like to uh, draw your attention. Questions often come in exams, in MCQs, and often comes in uh, short notes. Is peripelvic and a parapelvic cyst? Okay, so uh, fine. So let me okay, let me get my drawing board ready. Okay, because I will be using my drawing board uh, most of the time. Just, just give me a second, okay? Just give me a second. Let me stop my share. Let me screen share once again. Right. So, what over? Uh, what I wanted to talk about is, uh, let me tell you, is so this is the kidney, okay? And uh, this is the pelvis. Fine. A renal sinus is a potential space, okay, which envelops the renal pelvis so somewhere over here okay, is a potential space somewhere over here okay and it contains some fibro fatty materials and some lymphatics it is during all those uh, uh, that radial nephrotic when you had this uh, uh, what they say i just forgot the name i mean extended pyelolithotomies extended pyelolithotomies when you are using an open surgery for the treatment of the extraction of a staghorn stone large stone involved with the whole of the pelvis you need to put in some special retractors called the uh, i just forgot the number of retractors okay so um, let me let me recollect it and i will tell you <laughs> and uh, then you put those retractors okay then you put those retractors inside this renal sinus and you have to go you have to go with the peanut dissection blunt dissection and you create this space okay so that you get extra space to so that your incision does not cut through, cut through the pelvis and go into the parenchyma. So you get enough spaces. This is a very important potential space. Okay. So, uh, so what is the importance of this? Because there's a lot of lymphatic, sub, lymphatic uh, vessels over here. So there may be a lymphatic cyst over here. This is known as the peripelvic cyst. Often, often you will have patients suffering what on this ultrasound they show that they may be having a parapelvic cyst now what is a so by by basically by by a normal count you can say what is the difference between a peripelvic and a parapelvic cyst and what is the importance in the management a peripelvic cyst it will actually is a lymphatic cyst 
which comes up from this renal sinus and then and then it 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 uh, invades or you can say it compresses upon this uh, renal parenchyma okay and any exophytic cyst of the renal parenchyma which is engulfing the renal sinus and then involving the renal pelvis becomes a parapelvic cyst so this is a simple definition simple difference between a peripelvic and a parapelvic cyst okay so peripelvic cysts as they say they are mostly congenital the lymphatic uh, some lymphatic problem in the problem in the lymphatic walls but parapelvic cysts as they say are sporadic cysts any cyst which enlarges to that extent like a parapelvic mostly with para because peripelvic cysts they go outside parapelvic cysts they involve the pelvis compresses upon the pelvis and causes some compression symptoms needs cyst expiration decortication or whatever some form of treatment while this peripelvic cysts are better conservatively treated okay so this is one thing about peripelvic parapelvic cysts the, which you may get in short note okay fine let me share the screen once again so this is all about renal cyst so this is a person who actually revolutionized revolutionized the whole treatment paradigm of renal cysts when he brought into this is a radiologist not a urologist this is a radiologist who who brought into the bosnia classification often you will get short questions in bosnia classification often you will get a viva table in bosnia classification and it's very important a lot of you can drive you can draw pictures and you can show do a beautiful uh, short notes on just drawing pictures and they may even ask you questions what i want to hammer on this is most of the renal mass this uh, cystic masses are bosnia classification 1 that is there is no contrast enhancement and the cyst is basically simple cyst that simple cyst means there's no calcification no nodularity and there is no hairline septations these are three topics you have to understand septations hairline septations smooth margins and all these things i talked about nodularity and calcifications and no contrast enhancement bosniak 2 will be same thing maybe very hairline sort of septations or minimal calcifications right but they essentially don't enhance with contrast now this contrast enhancement is basically a ct scan finding okay so ct scan finding we will be discussing when we are talking about the rcc case now again i want to just hammer on the topics over and over again so it gets in your mind and you are able to recollect when you are always talking uh, about something else because ct scan when you are asked about a question on renal lump and the examiner ask you what is the best diagnostic test of uh, gold standard diagnostic test a uh, radiological test you need to do is basically a uh, uh, a triphasic triphasic helical ct scan of the whole abdomen now you can say you can say kub doesn't matter whole abdomen basically you have to know about the the not only on the kidneys but also on the areas of interest when you think about metastasis liver and some people even say that you must say that is a cct contrast and ct scan of the whole abdomen pelvis plus a non contrast uh, examination of the thorax as well but there will be controversies where the best thing is to say everything together some people say if, if there is no amount there is no uh, nothing on the chest x ray nothing uh, no history of cuff you, you can uh, omit but as a protocol say i do a a triphasic uh, helical contrast uh, fine sec fine uh, cuts um, that will be on helical uh, and uh, contrast in a ct scan of the abdomen and pelvis uh with the city of the thorax okay now why do we do so the examiner may ask you can can basically go jolly well do a ct city of the kub why are you asking the patient to shell out more money for that uh, whole abdomen now the answer is the answer is that the patient may have metastasis which may be missed so you have to look for liver you have to look to lungs you have to look the uh, the, the the nodes as well because earlier we used to have this very importance of the uh perihilar lymph nodes and the dissection so you have to look up the lymph nodes as well again a patient of a renal cell carcinoma maybe an incidental finding it come with a history of hematuria so is often important that even if he has a rcc i'm not talking about tcc i'm talking about rcc the patient can have a second primary or the second malignancy associated with the urinary bladder 
So it is very important that you do the whole section right from the T12 vertebra up to the say lesser trochanter of that. As you know, an IVP, the IVP the scout film. Now, when you when you are when you are asked to describe the scout film and IVP, so it's taken from the 12 uh, 12 uh, T12 up to the lesser trochanter of the humerus. So this is the area you need to focus on. Okay. So uh, next we have this. Uh, uh, there are two things in the class two cysts. One is one is known as the hyperdense cyst. Hyperdense cyst is now, as I was saying, that what is triphasic CT? Everything has a some importance. What is triphasic? Triphasic first you have a non-contrast section, then you give contrast. That contrast is iso or smaller uh, non-ionic contrast. Okay. Now, when you give the contrast, then the, uh, the first phase will be an uptake phase, which is known as the corticomedullary phase. The next phase is a nephrographic phase. Okay, so it's important that in the corticomedullary phase will there will be differential of the uptake in the cortex and the medulla, but the small small tumors they light up with contrast enhancement in the nephrographic phase, and the third is excretory phase, which is most important for delineation of a TCC pelvis or a TCC of the kidney. Okay, so not very much important when we talk about the RCC. Fine, so it's a triphasic. So again, the, the question may the examiner may ask you. Now, what do you mean by contrast enhancement? Okay, so on a non-contrast film, you will have some some Hounsfield units. Okay, Hounsfield units. But that is the unit for contrast. Okay, enhance contrast, whatever you call uptake of the contrast. Now it is said the zero Hounsfield unit signifies water. So I can say so. Suppose a renal cyst, which is nothing but fluid-filled cyst, water-filled cyst. Will have a contrast enhancement, or will have a normal contrast of zero Hounsfield unit. Okay. Whenever and and a minus thousand will be air, plus thousand will be bones. This is a small question they may ask you. Now, what happens with the contrast enhancement? Whenever the enhancement after you give a contrast is more than plus twenty Hounsfield unit, it is said to be a significantly contrast enhanced. Okay. Now, as you can say, the patient may have a cyst. And the patient may had uh, some injury or some trauma, and they had uh, some bleeding within the cyst, and it formed a clotted blood, old clotted blood. So obviously, the uh, Hounsfield unit in this case will not be zero; it will be more than zero, and it will be say about fifty Hounsfield unit. Okay, fifty Hounsfield unit. So again, what will you say? This, what does it mean? About fifty Hounsfield unit, which had a bleeding in the past, and some old clotted blood is there. This can. This is not pre-malignant lesion, so you give the contrast and you see that Hounsfield unit, the 50 Hounsfield unit, has not increased up. That is not uh, uh, enhanced in contrast. So that's then known as the hyperdense cyst, type two hyperdense cyst. So this is a subcategory of the type two cyst. This other thing known as a type two F cyst, where F signifies follow. Now, as you can say, how one cyst doesn't have any any importance in follow. Two five percent may still when it turn malignant in the long term just ask them to go for a annual uh, follow up but this hyper uh, what i said 2f cysts will have some amount of some amount of septation minimal calcification but they will enhance not up by 20 but less than 20 enhancement so these are said to be uh, what category of 2f cysts which have however been questioned by the recent update in bosnian classification but for now we go with 2f cyst 2f cyst does come with a short note okay so there are minimal enhancement and it said 10 to 15% may turn malignant it's a big percentage so these require extensive follow up okay and bosnian type 3 cyst with moderate calcification with contrast enhancement and the four is a cystic rcs there's a nodularity and irregular margin and everything necrotic material inside so it's a frank cystic rcs a cystic rcs even though looks ghastly but has a good prognosis vis a vis a solid rcs that's very important okay now we come to different uh, you can say benign renal tumors benign renal tumors now the most common solid benign now they may ask you what is the most common malignant renal tumor which you know most common solid benign uh, benign tumor which is oncocytoma most common benign renal lesion is a renal cyst most common renal malignancy is actually a renal metastasis okay 
renal meds. So these are the most common things you may have in your MCQs. So the oncocytoma is the most common solid benign tumor, but there is amount of contrast enhancement. So by your face value, you cannot say that this is an oncocytoma, this is a benign tumor, I will keep it alone. Okay, and it has been seen also, it has been seen also if you do a biopsy, then you have to use all these uh, HMB45 and all these high, high value, all, all these uh, newest uh, uh, genomic markers to signify that this is basically an oncocytoma and not a RCC. It's called immunohistochemical stains. And uh, when we were giving our exams, we had only this Hales colloidal IRS, which actually signifies that the, uh, that the tumor has an oncocytoma. But these are again not foolproof and you cannot depend on them or you can miss up RCC. And often said, a patient of oncocytoma may have coexistent RCC in the same kidney. Okay, so you have, you have to presume them to be due to RCC until you surgically excise and send the material for biopsy. So obviously, it's a candidate for a radical nephrectomy. Now, there are three things you have to note when you write a short note and when you, when you get a MCQ on this, is what is the concept of a pseudometastasis? Now, if you see the Google, the pseudometastasis, you won't find anything on what is pseudometastasis. There may, you may have one or two papers saying that, oh, oncocytoma is known for pseudometastasis, but there's nothing know what is pseudometastasis. In fact, I've just went through all these things, uh, all the scholarly article section, and just found out that these actually, because they, uh, it's just like happens in, I can tell you, leomyosarcoma of the kidney. When you see leomyosarcoma of the kidney, one of the differential diagnoses of a very uh, extensively advanced and extensively growing and a very bad prognostic renal uh, cancer. These, same with oncocytoma, okay? These tumors actually, the, uh, the main tumor, main tumor cells will actually go through a pseudo capsule and involve the surrounding tissues. So the surrounding tissues is not actually metastasis, it's by, by direct invasion through a pseudo capsule. I think it can be a pseudo metastasis, but just go through it. I may be wrong, but I found it in the this thing. So this is these are two tumors which have evidence of pseudo metastasis. Other two things is a central st a stellate scar. Whenever you excise, you can also find it on the CT scan. I mean, I, I have a picture like this. Yes, this is a central stellate scar. Typical, typical large tumor. You, you may you cannot say whether it's a this thing a RCC or a oncocytoma but there is a central stellate scar, something like this, okay? So it's solid, it enhances in a central stellate scar. Now you cannot leave this tumor saying that, okay, sir, this is a, a, a benign oncocytoma, I will just follow him up. You won't be able to do this. Even in exam, you say, I will go for a radical nephrectomy, okay? And on angiography, you may have a spoke wheel pattern, okay, fine. So the next important, the next important benign renal tumor, of very important examination point of view, and also from practice point of view, which is what is known as the angiomyolipoma. Now, Grau is the person who actually said the Grau's tumor is a hypernephroma, later turned out to be a RCC, uh, actually also described the angiomyolipoma. It was who also first described the angiomyolipoma. He actually said it's a polyclonal origin, okay? it's a hamartoma. In the previous textbooks of Gamble, which we actually studied, AML, uh, we described it as a hamartoma because there will be fat, there will be bones, there will be this thing, that thing, but the bones is actually uh, missing out in AML. Nowadays, it says it's actually a monochrome. It's alive. It, it, it derives the perivascular epithelial itself. Okay. And it is the most common renal uh, neoplasm which is associated with a spontaneous perirenal bleed. So whenever you have a CT scan section, showing Hounsfield unit suggestive of a perirenal bleed. So there's a kidney and there's a perirenal bleed all around. Then the first diagnosis comes in your mind is actually an AML. AML has a size criteria cutoff of more than four centimeter, which are likely to bleed. They, are, they may be hypervascular, most likely hypervascular. They may have aneurysmal dilatation on the CT scan, which are more likely to bleed. The patient may be a pregnancy status, which are more likely to bleed. Okay, these are the high risk factors. So any tumor which is more than four centimeter AML in a pregnant woman with, uh, with aneurysmal dilatation of CT, better you have a close watch and go for active intervention. What is active intervention? It can be uh, basically uh, 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 selective angioembolization under CT guidance or 
or or or not under city guidance okay or or it can be uh, um, or it can be uh, this nephrectomy basically it ends up into nephrectomy okay it ends up in nephrectomy so uh, the, the few things you have to note is uh, tuberous sclerosis tuberous sclerosis will have a bilateral uh, AMLs we have small AMLs uh, AMLs are normally common in more common in women but when it comes to tuberous sclerosis it's more common in both the sexes okay and um, then there's a Wunderlich syndrome, 10% of AMLs, they happen spontaneous bleeding and very high rate of uh, the patient goes into uh, small for hypovolemic shock and this often needs. Either you go for an NG embolization per se or the patient uh, will need to go for nephrectomy and the high risk concern. Okay? These are mostly fat containing AMLs. The AMLs are mostly fat containing, the fat Hounsfield unit is 20, minus 20. Now, in this in this uh, context, again, I want to give you one small tip is about contrast enhancement. Uh, you use CECT in most of the cases, isn't it, for, for the evaluation of a renal tumor. Now, often happens is that uh, when you are uh, having a patient of patient with a creatinine which has been raised, okay, creatinine which has been raised. So let me see whether you have any chat or not. Just, Okay, no, nobody in the chat section till yet. Okay, fine. So somebody has a creatinine which is raised more than 1.6, 1.7, depends upon the lab actually. Then, then uh, the lab technician will say, no, sir, I won't be able to give you the option of giving a contrast. Hmm? Contrast. I won't be able to give you a visit back in this case because the patient has a high creatinine levels. So what will you do? Then you will do a if you want a contrast enhancement, because you now need to know the enhancement pattern, then you will have to do a MRI. So the what is the role of MRI? MRI can be done in this patients. Uh, one is the tumor thrombus and all this. When you're thinking of IVC thrombus, that's fine. But patients in whom, initial part, patients in whom his creatine is very high, renal impairment, okay. But again, this uh, enhancement uh, uh, in uh, T1, T2 sections on the MRI, uh, we'll actually see a 20% increase in contrast enhancement huh? when you give a gadolinium contrast. Gadolinium is the chelate is the contrast agent when you give an MRI, MRI, MRI of the kidneys. Okay. Now again, when the creatine goes above 2.4, 2.5, again, MRI with contrast cannot be given because most of you know this case because the patient can will turn up into nephrogenic systemic fiber, NSF, the nephrogenic systemic fibrosis. Okay. So this is important. Now, the differential diagnosis, again, my friend, is that the PACE person can have a liposarcoma, that is sarcoma. What is important over here? Let me stop the share. If, if you have any question, you can always ask me, okay? Don't worry. So this thing will go on, but ask questions if you have any doubts. So uh, what happens in um, liposarcoma is, suppose this is the kidney, okay? Liposarcoma, what happens is, it is a huge tumor. Okay, liposarcoma is basically, as I said, it has also a pseudometastasis. Pseudometastasis because the huge tumor is progressively increasing in this thing. But what happens is that it, it engulfs the pelvis. It engulfs the pelvis. So it looks like whole kidney has been deranged. But what happens in uh, uh, AML? What happens in AML may also become very large, it's more than seven centimeter, more than four, more than seven centimeter. But what AML does is that it just indents, it's called the indentation sign, indentation sign on the CT scan, just indents, the fat actually indents on the pelvis. So it's called the indentation sign on the uh, CT scan. Now that how to differ between, how to uh, differentiate between a, a fat containing RCC, RCC may also contain fat and AML has also fat components. In these cases, actually, you see that the calcification will be noted in RCC, but calcification is never, bones are not found in, bone company not found in AML, okay? So that's it. Now, so you have to do for a percutus biopsy with all these newer uh, agents, huh? immunohistochemistry. So whenever the paper, when the examiner asks you that uh, what are the stains you use, what are the percutus biopsy, you may not know any, any of them, it's totally theoretical, and I don't think it's, it's very important. It will be colossal if you try to memorize every, all these HMB stains and everything. Just say, I, I, I will go for immunohistochemistry stain. That's all. Okay. So as I said, management depends upon size, presence of symptoms. Okay, fine. And you, the emergency is selective angioembolization. Okay, so fine. So this is, 
Mm. Okay, fine. So I will tell you. Okay, fine. I will tell you. Uh, uh, before we go to next RCC, let me uh, just tell you three. Uh, 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 what are pseudo tumors of the kidney? Pseudo tumors of the kidney comes on your short notes. What, what is pseudo tumors of the kidney? Right. So we have a benign. We have talked about benign tumors. Everything on benign tumors mostly. You may have a, a cystic nephrom and all these things. They're all basically. Uh, you can go through them all yourselves. Okay. They're not important clinically. Uh, but the pseudo tumors are three types. Okay. What happens is one is known as a dromedary hump. Says this, this is the kidney on the left side. Okay. And this is the spleen. Some some people have a very large spleen. It 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 basically encroaches upon the anterior surface of the kidney and makes a hump, or makes a something. The kidney becomes like this because of the spleen. So this hump becomes known as a dromedary hump or dromedary lump, and this can look like a tumor, but obviously the patient doesn't have a any form of tumor, benign tumor or malignant tumor. Okay, this is one. The second is the hypertrophic columns of Bertin. Okay, what is hypertrophic columns of Bertin? Very simple, I will want to tell you is that uh, this is the cortex. Okay, this is the cortex. This is the medulla, and the medulla has numerous pyramids. Okay, numerous pyramids look like this. Okay, this is basically the anatomy, the anatomical architecture of a kidney. And the pyramids, you have this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, what is known as the papilla. This is known as the papilla, the tip of the pyramid, which drains into a minor cortex. Okay. Now, during development, one of this pyramid will be displaced, okay, and it comes like over here, okay. This is known as the hypertrophic columns of Bertin. So this will cause because this is a one of the pyramid which is hypertrophic and it's there's nothing wrong in it. In between, this is there's a cortical septum, and then again this is a pyramid over here. So it becomes the kidney looks like like this because of the enlargement. There's a lot of things together, it becomes enlarged. So kidney looks like a small sort of tumor. Okay, so, uh, looks like like this. Okay, this this, this is a hump, and again goes like this. But these never enhance. Remember, these never enhance. The another thing is persistent fetal lobulation. Persistent fetal lobulation is normally this renal pyramids. They basically look very beautiful. Okay, and they are very symmetrical. Okay, but some cases they become bumpy. They become bumpy. And looks like a very irregular shaped kidney. Again, this is the embryologic variant, and these three co constitutes what is known as a pseudo tumors of the kidney, which can confuse you in radiology. But again, you ask for, you ask for this uh, CT scans. Okay. Now, my next uh, topic of interest. So, if you have any question, you can always ask me, or you go to. Um, fine. Okay. Fine. So, this is a case. This is a case I want to discuss with you. Okay. I think I had this case discussion a long term back. Okay, so just put it out from the archives and just wanted to talk about it because something on RCC. Okay, so okay, somebody has shown in the chat. Okay, if I if I am able to open the chat when I'm this thing. Okay, I will look at the chat. I'm not able to open the chat window somehow. Just give me time. I will just open the chat window. Take your questions. So we have a 45-year-old man, okay, who was present with a pain in the right flank region, which is dull, lacking, intermittent, non-radiating, and he had hematuria two episodes, which is gross, which is with clots, total right from the time he starts urinating up to the end, painless, painless hematuria, and the the, the sign qua non of a hematuria. From the kidney, is that the person will have a vermiform or a serpentine clots? Okay, so this is the negative history, and you also say there's a significant weight loss. All the specific negative history you have weight, and and the person is is a chronic smoker. Go examine the patient on the ECOG status because this is very important. These all these prognostic factors, patient factors, what is uh, Karnofsky scale, what is the ECOG status? That is the normal performance status of the patient. His hemoglobin level, his calcium level, okay, all these are important. So is the TNM stage, okay, and then there are different markers. We'll go through them. These are the very prognostic factors in RCC. So again, this is basically a incidental finding. There is no positive finding over here, and this is a typical characteristics of a renal lump. 
So you have to look. This is very common to any of you. Can you can take a screenshot before whenever you go for an examination. You have to note all these points. Fine. So you have to look for the size and size and tenderness, everything for a lump. You have to look on the margins. You have to look for a, whether there's a notch in the medial margin or not. If it, if you don't find it, just write. I can't find a notch in the medial margin. Okay. You have to look for the mobility with respiration, and whether it's bimanually palpable and palatable. Okay. You can't see the screen, sir. You can't see the screen. We're just seeing the icons, sir. We can't see the slides. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thank you. Are you able to see this now? Tell me. Are yes, sir. Now we can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this thing. So, uh, and whether you will able to uh, insert into fingers with the lump and the cos. This you know. Just just jot down the points. Take a screenshot and incorporate it in your this in your finding on the exams. Okay. Now these are the investigation. So. And you do it. The first step in any renal lump will be an ultrasound. Okay. Any any renal swelling, renal lump, renal case, whatever. Whenever you think that you are uh, dealing with a, a, a kidney pathology, say you need an ultrasound. And uh, whenever you see the ultrasound place, examination may not uh, tell you to read ultrasound place because they are more interested in you reading CT scan plates. Okay. So you will get something like this. You have to comment on the bladder because the patient has a this thing on uh, hematuria. So whenever I feel hematuria, just be sure always talk about urinary bladder, even if the the, the case of clean cut RCC, because often we miss a secondary pathology which may be in the bladder as well. Okay. Previously we used to have to say that now before you do radical nephrectomy, you have to do cystoscopy as well. But with this newer generation CD scanners, this has gone out of of this thing. Okay. So. This is the mass lesion, and then you do the this uh, triphasic CT scans. Always start your discussion with the with the other kidney, the normal kidney. Okay, you first see. Don't say. Don't talk on a single CT scan plate. You see whole of the CT scan, whole series, and then give your own judgment. Okay, so you have to also ask what is the contrast value on the non-contrast flame? How much it has gain in gain in contrast enhancement after you give the contrast? And uh, if and also ask for a CT NGO, okay. So that's very important because you are going to deal with a, a radical nephrectomy or partial nephrectomy, whatever. You have to know uh, what are the vascular uh, structure architecture like. So always say, I want to go for a contrast on CT scans. What are the horns pool? You know what is the pre-contrast value? What is the post-contrast value? And uh, please uh, send me some NGO uh, films as well, okay. So that's that's a typical CT scan. You can take a screenshot again, and this is this is simple. I mean, you know better than me on this. So these are the few thick, uh, pictures, representative sections of an RCC. Okay, the most important thing is that you have to uh, uh, basically you have to know what is uh, in very brief uh, that what are types of RCCs. And uh, basically, the most of them are clear cell carcinomas, and uh, uh, the other is a papillary cell carcinoma. The others we basically don't come across too many. One is the medullary cell carcinoma, and it is very common in sickle cell young patients. So the sickle cell young patients may come as a this EMQs or MCQs, and with a very largely growing uh, renal cell carcinoma, it's likely to be medullary cell variant. Okay, chromophobe carcinomas are also there. They may which, which may which may have some. Uh, Uh, differential diagnosis with uh, oncocytoma, but the most important thing is RCC. Most of the uh, that clear cell carcinoma, these are hypervascular tumors. Okay, and uh, this thing, uh, papillary carcinoma, you may ask be asked questions which RCC does not enhance well on contrast enhancement. In this case, these are papillary RCCs. Okay, as I said, papillary RCCs don't do uh, clear cell carcinoma associated with the VHL gene, while papillary cell carcinomas don't are not associated with VHL gene. And all these tyrosine kinase inhibitors don't have any role on, pa on papillary carcinomas, and not all these uh, radiofrequency ablation and all these newer techniques uh, of thermal ablative treatments have any role on uh, papillary renal cell carcinomas. Papillary renal cell carcinomas are associated with CMET oncogene. This is a very small thing, all MCQ based. Okay, so this is the one pathology. Uh, you just go through the pathology part of the, uh, the RCCs. Okay, the most important uh, thing I I think is about So you have to know about this VHL stuff. Okay, uh, as I said, one thing is very important. What is the wild? They say, no. What is the uh, 
um, I just forgot what is a wild type protein or what is a wild type gene. Okay, a wild is actually a normal gene, right? So a VHL gene, which is present in the short term of chromosome number three, the wild variety is actually a normal gene. But there will be if there's a mutated form that happens in a clear cell arsis. Okay, if the if this VHL gene is mutated. Then what really happens is this upregulation of HIF1 alpha. HIF1 alpha is normally downregulated, as happens in everybody. HIF1 alpha is the that's the uh, uh, this just forgot about the full name. HIF1 alpha, just go through it. Okay, so whenever HIF1 alpha is upregulated, there is increased number of proteins, which are known as the VGF, the vascular endothelial growth factor. The PDG of the platelet derived growth factor and another there is another thing that I forgot. Okay, the three basically things: the TGF, the transforming growth factor alpha and beta. All these, when they are upregulated, when the hypoxic inducible factor alpha is also upregulated, when the normal wild variant of VHL is mutated, then there is excess amount of angiogenesis. Whenever there is angiogenesis, there is lot of potential of tumor to advance. In size and also the tumor to metastasize, and the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which are the newer drugs, which not the newer drugs, have been ten years in the sunitinib and sorafenib has been discovered. Now, what is the role of these immunotherapies and all these things? They have been discovered just to focus their focuses on inhibiting the receptors of this VGF, PDGF, and all this TGF alpha, so the proteins cannot act on the receptors. So even if the VHL protein is Uh, mutated, even if the HIF alpha, the hypoxia inducible factor alpha is upregulated, even all these proteins, all these TGF have been increased in amount in our body. They cannot act to increase the tumor. Uh, this thing. So, if you have a patient of metastatic disease, then you can firstly start him on sunitinib or sorafenib, which are the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Downstairs the disease and do a cytoreactive nephrectomy. This is the concept of cytoreactive nephrectomy where you do a radical nephrectomy, even if the patient has metastasis. Normally, no. Normally, what we know is the patient has metastatic disease. Then what is the role of removing the primary uh, organ? But it has been seen with cytoreactive nephrectomy, even the metastasis they go off. Even the metastasis they go off in some cases. Okay. So this is about the CRN. So as you know. This is this is basically the picture to show you how the radical nephrectomy, uh, how the RCC looks like. Okay, with contrast enhancement, irregular contrast enhancement, lots of necrosis, and you also look whether the renal veins have been involved or not. Okay, so this is the indication of MRI. As I said, is uh, one is uh, if the if the patient has uh, high creatine levels, locally advanced because at locally advanced the tissue the the tissue plane disruption. Okay, which happens in many cases will be seen better with MRI. Equivocal venous involvement because venous IVC involvement has been better picked up on MRI and allergic to IV contrast media. Okay, so again, this is all about IVC involvement. You look for the now this has been said very important. You look for pedal edema. You look for varicosin in a male patient, and it's also very important the patient has a right-sided varicosin without a left-sided varicosin because left-sided varicosin are more common. And the right side may be associated with left side varicoses, but if the right side varicoses are present per se only without left side varicoses, then you always think that there may be some retrocal peritoneal pathology which is compressing upon the testicular vein. So the you can have a pedal edema, non-recumbent, and the and the if, if the patient lies down, the varicosal does not go off. It's a non-recumbent right side and non-recumbent varicosal. Okay, you can have proteinuria, and you can have a pulmonary embolism, non-functioning of the kidney. It's very important that uh, there may be an IVC involvement as well. Okay, so now you have to detect. Uh, so this is a metastatic workup I talked about. The very important thing in here is they may ask you a question about the paraneoplastic syndrome. Now, what is paraneoplastic syndrome? The person may have hyperglycemia. Okay, and uh, and uh, suppose suppose we had a patient and it's a real life scenario. The patient had a this thing. It has high bilirubin level. Okay. And uh, we thought about what is the cause of this high bilirubin level. I mean, he's having high bilirubin. He's having respiratory and some other issues. We enter gastro refer, and the gastroenterologist also just was very confused what is happening. But the thing is, what is known as the Stoffer syndrome. And they will come you as a MCQ. They may ask you, but they're mostly MCQs and short notes. So paraneoplastic syndrome, two very important thing. One is hypercalcemia, hypercalcemia, 
and the treatment of choice as you always on this they can ask you one short question what are the two important paraneoplastic syndromes you know of erythropoietin release causing uh, erythrocytosis okay renin causing hypertension is important but erythrocytosis and also is a rare okay two important is stoffers which again is rare but it's very significant because these patients they present with jaundice and it, and, the, and, the, and the hepatic dysfunction is a non metastatic hepatic dysfunction okay and you have only to do a do a cyto do a sorry radical nephrectomy to cure his hepatic dysfunction fine so this is one stoffer syndrome the other is hypercalcemia hypercalcemia because this this tumors release parathyroid like hormones and the treatment of hypercalcemia when they ask you is acute management obviously is iv fluids with forced diuresis with lasix huh? okay and then you can go for this uh, zoledronic acid and they can ask you what's the dose 4 mg in 100 ml of normal saline and you give every 4 weeks this is a very important per question for as well as the prostate cancer and as well as for renal cancer who have this presence with uh, increased calcium levels and may have bone mass okay so calcium again is a poor prognostic factor ldh is a poor prognostic factor so uh, all these are uh, these things and uh, metastatic workup and this is all about the uh, paraneoplastic syndrome we talked about so we talked about vhl then they may ask you question on vhl syndrome and this is a rc is a part of the vhl syndrome there may be some some other tumors also hemangioblastoma of the retinal hemangioblastoma and all these things there, there are questions in the chat box which i am not able to open i will see this after i'm done with this okay and uh, so this is it so i talked about this uh, vhl gene and uh, where will you go for a renal biopsy now the renal biopsy is now coming in because this is in thing because previously you used to say what is the role in renal biopsies now we have small renal tumors now we say that even tumors as less as 1 cm have been picked up and they say 1 cm picked up may can be a metanephric adenoma it may can be an uh, uh, these are all benign tumors which may mimic renal cell carcinoma it's basically an overkill if you put do surgery on this kidneys now again the real cause of use of uh, renal mass biopsy is if you suspect if you suspect that the patient is a lymphoma lymphoma of the kidney is again a huge tumor of the kidney it may involve both the kidneys it may involve the retroperitoneal lymph nodes as well it may encase upon the kidney and the renal veins it may look ghastly there are basically five types of involvement of lymphoma on the kidney it may look ghastly but this when you just pick up a do a this fnac if and do our fna the renal mass biopsy see and the area is bigger okay i think that that that's that nothing to do with our class so so if you can start him on uh, this uh, chemotherapy and the patient has a brilliant response the patient has a brilliant response so one is lymphoma one is metastasis because metastasis renal met if you think about renal metastasis you have to look for the primary tumor renal metastasis the other is infection abscess and even you can say what are the mimickers of renal cell carcinoma which includes abscess acute uh, um, pyelonephritis focal pyelonephritis again, again may show a small tumor like lesion on the surface of the kidney and you have to do actually you put in a needle and drain the pus or do a uh, this biopsy and see there's a basically infective material you know malignancy as not at, at all and same thing happens with the xgp xgp is xanthal granulomatous pyelonephritis where the patient may have a pelvic stone and may have a kidney which looks like a renal cell carcinoma okay so these are the mimickers and then you go for renal renal mass biopsy and the other important thing is before you start all this tyrosine kinase inhibitors it is very important that you have to make it sure that you are dealing with a clear cell etiology so, so renal mass biopsy is done by true cut biopsies and there are a lot of immunohistochemistry uh, seen as well fine and even before radio frequency ablation now we have elderly patients presenting with 3 cm tumors okay which looks malignant on uh, ct scans you do a uh, this thing you do a renal mass biopsy turns out to be clear cell carcinoma and you can give him the option of a radio frequency ablation radio frequency ablation is nothing that you put in just you need to know that you need to put in some needles uh, into his kidneys directly from the surface under city guidance and then use the radio frequency currents and it will actually burn the tumors burn the tumors they are more likely to recur but that is a very good uh, option for very elderly individuals where you don't want to go for a you know, this watch and wait uh, policies okay so staging you know better than me again so staging basically uh, i want to tell you one thing is uh, this uh, this thing uh, 
let me let me just stop my share. I will be able to tell you one thing. This is very important because staging you know better than me. But I just wanted to tell you just one whiteboard stuff. Okay. 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 So if you have any question, you can again ask me. Huh? Not all answers will be possible. I won't be able to give you all answers, but I will try my best. Okay. So hold on, huh? Just give me ten minutes because I have to talk about the hydronephrosis also. Okay, right. Fine. So, uh, what did I? Where, where was I? Huh. So, uh, what really happens is, say this is the kidney. Suppose this is the kidney. Okay. So then you have the gerota. Okay, this is the gerota, and this is say the adrenals. The adrenal and the kidney are together, and these are the these are the vessels maybe. Okay. So then this is the great vessels. Okay. So say this is the anterior pararenal space so this is the perinephric space okay this is a, this is a renal capsule the, the gerota is first anterior parenal, this is a anterior parenal space and this is known as the posterior parenal space okay in front of it lies the peritoneum and over in lies the uh, i think it's the some fascia or transversal is fascia transversal is fascia so if the tumor is inside it becomes it, it is t2 up to t2 when it goes outside and involves it becomes t3 and goes outside over here becomes t4 now is very important if this contiguous involvement of the adrenal then it is basically t3 and nowadays has uh, there is a recent change in this thing in the nomenclature let me see again I think I'm making some mistakes. Okay. Just correct me if I'm wrong. Huh? You know, you people know better than me. Right. So, hey, yeah. nowadays it was used to be T3 adrenal involvement. Nowadays, contiguous adrenal involvement is actually said to be T4. So, if it is seen that there's adrenal involvement while the tumor is in the lower pole only, then it becomes an adrenal metastasis. Okay, this becomes a metastatic tumor, M1. So any form of adrenal involvement is actually a poor prognostic factor. So it used to be T3 in previous um, scoring, uh, previous uh, staging systems, and now become T4. Okay. So this is the prognostic factors I want to tell you. This is the anatomical TNM staging, histologic factors. I said clear cell is a bad prognosis. Papillary is actually a good prognosis. Grading is important. High grades are bad, as with all cancers, and the necrosis. Whenever you have a tumor necrosis, you say it's a poor prognosis. So whenever you see a see a CT scan which looks ghastly, try to comment on the necrosis part. So you can say it's a poor prognostic tumor. Okay, I will have to counsel regarding this uh, prognosis features. Then you have the clinical factors like uh, cancer, cachexia, anemia, low platelet counts. Okay, and then you have the molecular markers. So as you said. T3, okay, T3 or T4, this is a huge drop in the survival rates, okay. Management options, radical nephrectomy. Partial nephrectomy is very important is you remove the part of the tumor, okay. So what we do in a partial nephrectomy, no better than radical nephrectomy. I will not go into radical nephrectomy, just tell, tell you something on partial nephrectomy, okay. Tell you something on partial nephrectomy. Let me... Okay, in the meantime, can you explain regarding pseudomets and also Dr. Shraddha, also which tumor show that we have here? Pseudomets, Dr. Shraddha, is, um, I am also very, not very uh, confident as how does oncocytoma, there are two tumors for those pseudomets. One is oncocytoma, one is leomyosarcoma. Leomyosarcoma says because it's a mesenchymal tumor, it does not have any barrier when it involves the surrounding tissues with the tumor cells. The tumor cells can easily grow across the pseudo capsules into the surrounding tissues. The surrounding tissues may look like they have a metastasis, but actually it doesn't have a metastasis. It's basically the progression, the localized progression of the cancer cells. This is another pseudo metastasis for leomyosarcoma. For oncocytoma, most likely there is tumor. This is a tumor degeneration. Okay, the tumor degeneration, which actually the same thing happens. The tumor degenerates and actually involves goes through the planes. The pseudo same thing. Pseudo capsule happens with the uh, this thing also oncocytoma, 
and there may be involvement of the surrounding tissue say akin to leiomyosarcoma where actually there is no metastasis because it's not a malignant tumor it does not metastasize but the tumor cells which are not malignant per se it actually goes through the tissue planes and involves the surrounding structure this is not a pseudo metastasis again this is your homework for the day how whether what i have said about oncocytoma whether it's correct or not you have to go through the net and just search it and just uh, just return back to me with with what i have said which I, this is what i found it on the net actually i couldn't find anything about uh, oncocytoma or pseudo metastasis what is the role what is something like this okay now uh what please explain uh that's about dr shraddha dr abhi please explain two type of cyst starting thing cyst starting thing second time i think you are asking about the type 2 cyst isn't it type 2 cyst just can you just hold on and i get a call right over ha mukti ha ek to pore phone kori go ami eta class nichhi go hum bolo last e kichu kotha hoyni कथाटे There are two sub categories in type two Bosniak cyst, which is actually one is known as the hyperdense cyst. As I said, cyst which actually contains water, yeah, it's just basically fluid, water, water component, and the Hausdorff unit is only zero, and it does not enhance on CT when you give a contrast on CT. Now, if the in a hyperdense cyst is hyperdense cyst is actually the component is a old clotted blood somehow 10 years ago that the patient had in some house of trauma and there is some bleed within the cyst and it clotted and it just just made a ct when you see the ct when you see the non contrast ct you see the hausfeld unit is more than zero hyperdense is typically present with 70 hausfeld unit okay and again there has been a new category which hyperdense is constitute is cyst which is more than 3 cm okay more than 3 cm or uh, hausfeld unit more than 7 uh, 60 70 on non contrast sections okay and then when you give a contrast there is no contrast enhancement okay so you don't have to worry about this and the other other component of the type 2 cyst is the 2f cyst this knows follow up because there is some amount of nodularity some amount of septations which is of clinical significance and 15% of this 10 to 15% of type 2f cyst actually turns malignant that becomes a cystic rcc which is a type 4 cyst okay so can you again explain third type of pseudo tumor dr ask uh, dr amsa zafar okay fine the dr zafar uh, there are uh, three types of pseudo tumors what is the importance of pseudo tumors is is uh, actually uh, these tumor these, these these are present in many patients you can see them in your own clinical practice also once or twice that these have typical when you see the ultrasound no they have typical uh, features of malignancy the kidney outline is totally shaggy the outline is irregular you see a lump on the surface of the kidney but when you do a contrast enhancement you do that doesn't enhance in contrast okay there are three types one is known as the hypertrophic columns of bertin as i showed you is that the pyramids these are these are two pyramids okay there are two pyramids and in between there is a septa because over there is a cortex over overlying is the cortex then the pyramid and then the pelvis okay and the uh, the medulla medulla is form of pyramids so the medulla has two triangular shaped structures and in between there is a septum going inside which is known as the cortical septum okay but there may be an extra pyramid extra pyramid in between two pyramids that becomes a hypertrophic column because there's no space it tends to go up and the cortex the cortex and the lining the capsule becomes a punched up the two is uh, i said there's a compression of the spleen on the surface of the kidney which forms a hump hump is not the compression because it compresses and the capsule is elastic there will be a compensatory increase just beside it a compensatory hump just beside the where it compresses upon so this is called a dromedary hump and the third is persistent uh, what what did they i just forgot what what forgot about the third thing will come will come to my mind and again tell you so can you explain the third what is the third type you are asking 
<laughs> I just forgot. With the flow, I just forgot. Please name that type of pseudo tumor that's called dromedary hump. Dromedary hump. Yeah, Doctor uh, Amatullah, thank you. Thank. Can you please repeat the dose of zoledronic acid? Is it's available in four milligram vials? You have to uh, dissolve it in hundred ml of normal saline. You have to give it over, I think, two hours, and the, uh, it's given in every month. Ideally, every three weeks, but sometimes every month. You have to check the calcium levels after when they come. Okay. So. And can you please repeat part of VHL gene in treatment? Yeah, that's very important. Structures removed in radical nephrectomy, Dr. Anu, very important, very important. Structures removed in radical nephrectomy. You have to remove the whole of the kidney with the with the renal artery in the renal vein. You have to with, with the increase within the uh, gerotas fascia. Okay. The most important thing: where will you going to remove the adrenals? Okay. When there is a very large tumor, more than seven centimeter tumor. When it's an upper polar tumor, and there's when there's a visible palpable visible on the CT scan, palpable on also on the uh, on palpation that there's a there's a, a adrenal involvement. Otherwise, you basically don't go for adrenal uh, this thing. And uh, the previously there was uh, con there was some about the whole you go for the whole uh, dissection dissection of the lymph nodes right from the cross of the diaphragm to the uh, common iliac nodes. Now it is we use the perihelial lymph nodes only. Okay, so. VHL gene in treatment is a very important uh, thing. So this all needs about a. <coughs> so in the meantime, talk about VHL gene. Just let me uh, start my because we already have world out of time. Just take five minutes uh, talking about this thing. Sure, let me share. VHL, na? Okay. Are you able to see my slides? Yes. If so, no, no sir, not. You are not able to see my slides. Okay, fine. Let me do it again then. VHL is actually Are you now able to see my it will take some time actually to load. VHL what yes. happens is you are able to see. Fine, thank you. VHL what happens is as I said there is a wild type of gene. Wild type is actually the normal gene. Okay. And the other thing is abnormal type is a mutated gene by some form of environmental, some, some, some mutation. What happened is that the wild type of VHL becomes a mutated form. Genes are located in chromosomes and this is a short type of chromosome number three, 3P chromosome. So what happens over here is the VHL gene is mutated. So it's, it's an abnormal gene. In a normal way, this VHL will actually downregulate a protein known as the hypoxic inducible factor alpha. It's called a HIF alpha. Okay. So what really happens when the VHL gene is uh, mutated, this HIF alpha will be upregulated. Now, what does HIF alpha do is that because it is a hypoxic inducible factor, this is a local hypoxia environment uh, occurs, it will increase the production of proteins, which are this VGF, that's a vascular cellular growth factor, which is a PDGF planted derived growth factor, and the transforming growth factor alpha and beta, which actually increases the generation of blood vessels within the tumors. So there's a lot of angiogenesis. Renal tumors are very, that's like the kidneys of the, when they originates, they're, they're very vascular. And what really happens is that they cause hematuria, and also it, just the tumor goes out. They are metastasized very early and they also become a locally advanced. So all these poor prognostic factors are happening because all these genes, which are upregulated because of HIF alpha. This is a very this is a very easy concept to understand. Okay. Now, what really what is the importance of this thing? One is it with VHL syndrome, von Nippel Lindau disease it happens because the patients will have VHL gene. RCC is associated with VHL gene, that's also happens. Importance lies when you are using tyrosine kinase inhibitors, all this immunotherapeutic, uh, this new genomic uh, treatment of RCCs. Now, what did they do? These actually, the, all this photomyl actinol receptor, PGF, PDGF, transforming growth factor, all these are everolimus, cyrolimus, and all this sunitinib, so all this axeltinib, palestinib. There are, there are a lot of the hundred, I think, tinibs over here. Right. So what they do is actually they block the receptors. So the normal same thing happens. You know, better is, is all in biochemistry. So the normal proteins cannot act. So the normal proteins cannot act. The whole process of metastasis, the whole process of advancement of the disease is cut short. 
Okay, so the disease is brought into abeyance. Disease has come to a stay. Then you can go for a cytotoxin nephrectomy to control the disease altogether. Even though the patient is a metastatic disease. Okay, so now the hydronephrosis due to PUJ. Just I will take five minutes just to finish it off because it is a part of your renal lump. Again, the patient. It's very. It's very curious. It's a congenital disease because in the because there is a junction between the pelvis and the ureter. And at the junction, the, all these uh, pacemaker cells are go into total disarray, and there is an atrotic segment. Previously, it says, says to be a uh, Osling folds that get they get uh, hypertrophied and they cause some form of anatomical obstruction. Nothing like that. It's just the aperistaltic segment at the junction of the pelvis with the ureter. So it can be a one centimeter, it can be a point one centimeter, and more than one centimeter. It causes a pew junction obstruction. This happens in Right from birth, but it comes in later. But it's, it it is uh, it is prevalent. It is we we get patients in the elderly age groups because many middle aged age group mostly middle aged age group, na? Because there is the collagen. The whole collagen issue takes some time to take some time to cause symptoms. Okay, so the patient may come later. So even though it's a congenital disease, okay. So there's something called the antenatal hydronephrosis. I'll take your question. I will take your question. Okay, antenatal hydronephrosis. Getting in the postnatal 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 period that becomes a part of the pediatric urology part, but this elderly patient, 20, 25 year male patient having hydronephrosis, pew junction obstruction, had this problem. Even we get patients as as late as 60, 70 years. They were did an ultrasound before, pew junction obstruction. Okay, so uh, so what really we have? This is very important. We talked about the renal lump, and uh, the ultrasound shows that the kidney parenchyma is basically gone. What we have is a back. Bag of pelvis. So the pelvis becomes a bag, and it is the, the kidney itself. So we have gross hydronephrosis. Gross hydronephrosis. Now, very important to tell you is um, a hydronephrosis is a dilatation of the pelvis. Okay, a pew junction obstruction. Actually, the there is a dilatation of the pelvis, but the ureter is not visualized on radiology. But hydronephrosis can be can be due to obstructive component, which is a pew junction obstruction. Or it can be due to reflux, isn't it? So a secondary hydronephrosis can also be due to not due to it can be due to uh, a stone causing an obstruction, or it can be due to reflux at the level of the vesicular uretic junction. Just akin to what happens in a normal household uh, toilets. What happens is that one of the one of the outlets of the say of the ground floor gets clogged. No, the second floor will get uh, overflowed. Right, the same thing. Of the reflux of the urine will cause hydronephrosis of the pelvis, the dilatation of the pelvis. So hydronephrosis per se is not an obstructive. Only with what is known as obstructive neuronephropathy. Okay, what is known as obstructive neuropathy? You obstructive neuropathy is that hydronephrosis due to obstructive component which is causing symptoms. And if it increases the creatinine level, becomes a obstructive nephropathy. So this is a hydronephrosis, pujo, obstructive neuropathy, obstructive nephropathy. Okay. We talk about dilatation of the pelvis more common in the pediatric age group. We also talk about the cortical thinness. Okay, so this is all about the CT scan. So very important when you are you are having a hydronephrosis case, your PUJ obstruction, you have to hammer that you need two for some of investigations. Okay, I need an anatomical investigation which can be a IVP, it can be a CT urogram, or it can be an RGP. Because in children, what we say that you don't go for IVP or CT urogram because they have radiation risk. Do a functional study and do do a uh, RGP on the table. Okay, what is a functional study? Functional study will actually show you to characterize the obstruction. That is how where is the obstruction? What is the degree of obstruction by what is the loss in the GFR compared to the other kid? Right? So the next thing is this is anatomical study. This is eye view. We will take one class later on eye view, and uh, this is the the TTP a diuretic renal scan. This is the functional study. Now I will tell you very simple in very quick uh, is what is a DTP a renogram? DTP is a glomerular agent. In children we use what is known as a tubular agent. We don't want to stress the glomerulus as such. So basically we need agents which will get uh, easily excreted. Okay. So a Mag three we use as a tubular agent for young patients. DTP is mostly for because we DTP is very easy to uh, easy to buy and is very low cost. But again, we have another very important uh, contrast material known as the EC. 
Okay, so you have an EC dioptic renal scan, which is done in many centers in India today, which is actually is a is a is a is a tubular agent where the, actually the the agent goes off flushes off easily and is not a very it's a very cost effective technique. So what really have we over here is we see the other kidney, we see this kidney, and we see the function wise. So it's very important for diagnosis and also for follow up. If you are done a study. Okay, if you are done a surgery in this case, and if you have a stent in C2, and you want to come back and see what is the improvement function, you do what is known as the well-tempered renogram. Professor, so now I will take just five minutes more, and then I will finish off. Okay, what is a well-tempered renogram? Whenever you have a stent in C2, you have to put in a catheter, hydrate the patient, and do a renogram to see whether the whether this uh, this thing has increased or not. Okay. So okay, what are the uh, so if you are a patient who is symptomatic, impairment overall renal function, and uh, development of stones of infection or hypertension, which is difficult to control with medicines, you have to go for surgery in this. And the surgery is basically a dismembered uh, pyeloplasty. One thing is very important; it's a very simple thing. Now you can just cut and just spatulate and repair. One thing is very important: Anderson Heinz pyeloplasty. Is the gold standard. It's basically, whenever somebody asks you a question, say, "I want to go for a modified Anderson Heinz pyeloplasty." This is a modified Anderson Heinz pyeloplasty. What is a normal Anderson Heinz pyeloplasty? Is Anderson Heinz are two surgeons who used the technique in the in the treatment of retrocaval ureters, where they didn't put in a stent, they didn't excise the end, they, they, because the retrocaval ureter doesn't have a redundant part. Okay, no need for resection of the redundancy, and also there is no spatulation. So what Foley did. Was that he modified it? Actually, it's a Foley's own surgery, but Foley's pyeloplasty we talk it as a spiral flap or a vertical flap. Okay, so uh, uh, a modified Anderson Heinz pyeloplasty is a gold standard because most of these patients have a crossing vessel which may cause the stricture or, or obstruction or may be associated with the obstruction. So in this case, you have to excise. The redundant part. Don't excise more than 1.5 centimeter of the pelvis, or you will miss the unique opportunity of suturing this pelvis with the ureter. And you cut the excised part and you spatulate. Okay. So this is all about this thing. And um, let me stop my share. I'm done with your renal lump. If I get another question, structure removed. Difference between partial nephrectomy and nephron sparing surgery. Uh, Perinephric and paranephric abscess. No, perinephric space and paranephric space. I told you this picture, na? No? The wonderful picture I showed you. Yes, uh, the same thing. I mean, nephron sparing surgery is actually partial nephrectomy. Okay. Now, there are different types of partial nephrectomy. Okay. Just if you give me another two minutes, I will complete my thing. So there were two things: a partial nephrectomy and perinephric and paranephric abscess. Okay. Let me share. Tell me you were able to see. Okay. Tell me if you're able to see. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So, uh, what happens in partial nephrectomy is I was talking about partial nephrectomy, then I forgot actually. Uh, okay, sure. Now, what happens in a partial nephrectomy is okay. Suppose there is one tumor over here. Okay. Previously, there was some elective indication for partial nephrectomy. When the person has a single kidney, the person has a uh, some disease of the other kidney, and the person has a bilateral tumors. Okay. Nowadays, every tumors we try to remove by partial nephrectomy because we need to keep at least at least twenty percent of the kidneys intact. If we remove more than say seventy, eighty percent of the kidneys, the rest twenty percent will actually die out because of hyperfiltration injury. Because now the kidney is not able to filter it properly, and the rest twenty percent will actually go off. So there is no reason if we have a large tumor like this involving more than seventy, eighty percent of the kidney, then there is no role for a partial nephrectomy. Now some person may ask, now what is the role? This you are saying by yourself. Okay, this may maybe it's my expert opinion, grade four evidence, level four evidence. Now, what is the typical score you need to follow when you do a partial nephrectomy? It's called a nephrometric score or the renal score. Now, renal R is the size or the radius. Okay, E is exophytic or endophytic. So, suppose this tumor can be easily excised by partial nephrectomy. Visa visa tumor on the right bang on the pelvis. 
n is again nearness to the pcs a is anterior and posterior so if you are doing a open surgery obviously posterior one will be easily approached Vis-a-vis, if you do a laparoscopic surgery, and the L is location from the line, from the uh, upper line of the kidney and the lower line of the kidney. It is said that anything which is on the upper pole or is easy to approach. What you do in partial nephrectomy is because you need to excise this tumor, because tumor because the kidneys are very vascular organs. You have to clamp. Clamp. Previously said, just just put a pressure on the renal parenchyma. Now this is gone off. You have to clamp the artery. Now what is people are doing without the clamp the artery? I don't know how. They are very expert surgeons. But you have to clamp the artery. You can keep the venous outflow patent, or you may clamp the veins as well. Now they said that the warm ischemia time is 20 to 25 minutes. We go beyond it. The whole purpose of doing a partial nephrectomy is lost. Okay, so previously, uh, the, prior to this clamping, you give uh, manitol, you give lasix, just to flush open so that there is no crystal deposition. What we do in partial nephrectomy, we do a wedge excision, wedge excision, or we do what is known as the segmental nephrectomy. Now, what is segment? We there are five segments of the kidney, which we'll tell later on: anterior, posterior, posterior, anterior. Then there will upper segment and middle segment. Either you move the go to that exact arterial branch. Go to the you don't you don't clamp the artery as such. You go to the different end arteries of the renal artery and clamp it over there, and then you remove that part of that because we know renal renal arteries are end arteries, the segmental arteries. So you remove that part of the kidney. So it's a segmental nephrectomy. The other is a wide local excision. Is you see you palpate and you keep at least a on frozen section. You keep at least a Uh, it's a five millimeter of tumor-free margin. Okay, or you see, you can because you are keeping the fat, uh, fat intact, and you also have a palpably normal free margins, which has to be uh, corroborated on frozen section as also. Or you can go for even for a hemineftrectomy. Hemineftrectomy is that what happens in hemineftrectomy? We have a duplicated system. Okay, duplex kidneys, duplex kidneys, and in one of the duplex you have can excise. So these are known as hemineftrectomy. So different, these are different types of partial nephrectomies, and it's also nephron sparing surgery. Some people say that even you can, uh, 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 if this, this this is not possible, then uh, then you have to go for radical even for all NSS you have to take consent for radical nephrectomy because one is they are very recurrent. If you feel that it is not if you are not able to do it on table, then you go and remove the kidney as such. Okay, so this is all. I think uh, regarding renal lump. Different than perinephric, right? Right. Before the end of perinephric and paranephric, I just showed you the diagram actually. Uh, diagram I showed you. Uh, so this is the last question we will take actually. Thirty of you, I hope I'm able to do justice. Huh? You gave me a lot of time. Uh, one and one and one and half. Uh, so hope it was uh, fruitful. Just go through the books once again and just tell me. You can always mail me. You can always mail Sheila Ji and Dr. Rudrajit Sina. So we'll get your questions if you have more questions with you. So what did I say? Ha! So this was a picture I actually drew. This is the kidney. This is the adrenal. This is the normal renal vessels. Okay. This is the gerotas fascia. This is the lateral conal fascia. This is the fascia of Zucker Kendall. Okay. This is the peritoneum. This is the fascia of whatever fascia, just for fascia transversal, something like that. Okay. This is the perinephric space, and this is the anterior parenchymal space, the posterior parenchymal space. Any pus over here will be a perinephric abscess, and any pus over here and over here will be a perinephric abscess. Okay. That's done. Boom. So thank you, thank you everybody. Thank you, Dr. Amatullah. Thank you, Dr. Shraddha. Fine. So we'll meet um, again. uh maybe on the last week we'll talk about uh, scrotal masses so in the meantime what is your homework you have to go to the net okay and tell me what is the how does oncocytoma causes pseudo metastasis let me tell you huh? just one single uh, homework i'm giving you for today just go to the net and i couldn't find a proper answer okay so if you are done then uh, okay bye bye